Well, good morning. We're, we're glad that you're here. Uh, if you are, if it's your first week, we've been working through a series in James. And uh, if it is your first week, I'm a little nervous about that. Normally I say, hey, it's a great week, first week, and but I'm nervous. If it's your first week, I don't want anybody to leave. But this passage in James, I think, is kind of a hard passage. One of the hard parts about going through a, a book of the Bible verse by verse is that you can't really skip the hard parts. And sometimes um, it's tempting as a speaker to skip the, the hard parts and just do the parts that are that are be, be real easy to explain and real easy to get into. But this section in James is kind of a tough section uh, that we're getting into today. And it's kind of a hard section. And it'd be one of those that I might I probably would have been tempted to skip if I didn't have to get into it. So I just want to warn you about that ahead of time. If you want to get ahead of me, we'll be in James here in a minute. You can look it on your Bible or on your phone app there if you have one, or I'll have it on the screen uh, behind me there as we get into it. I was thinking about this, this idea all week long about, uh, James is going to talk about our finances and talk about uh, money and, and those kinds of things, and, 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 uh, and so I was thinking about it, and, and I read, a st- my head, you, you end up and you, when you're thinking about that kind of stuff, you see other stories. In church history, around 250, two, uh, 255, somewhere in there, uh, there was a revival in Rome. A lot of Roman uh, people were giving up the idols and becoming Christians, and uh, and, and the emperor of Rome, uh, an emperor named Valerian, uh, was opposed to that. And so he declared that any leader of the church uh, was liable for execution. Uh, bishops, elders, deacons uh, were going to be killed, beheaded, most of them. And, and, and this was sent out, and a lot of them were killed. The, the guy who was the pope, uh, a man, uh, Pope Sixtus, uh, was, was killed there. And, and they arrested some of the deacons and elders and were killing them. Well, a, a man named Lawrence who the Catholic Church eventually canonized, St. Lawrence. If you, there's a St. Lawrence waterway in our country. There's a St. Lawrence is always named for this guy, Lawrence, was a deacon, and he was in charge of the treasures of the church. That was one of the things that was said about Lawrence. He was in charge of the treasure of the church. And when Valerian, the emperor, heard that Lawrence was in charge of the treasures of the church, he said to him, well, okay, bring me the treasures, and I'll let you go, thinking that there might be some gold in it, you know, gold candlesticks or something like that, and then I would get that, and then I'll let you go. Bring me the treasures, and I'll, I'll let you go. And so Valerian said he would need three days to get it all together, and, uh, and, and the emperor agreed to that. And over those three days, uh, he gave all the money the church had uh, to the poor in the community. He just gave everything away to the poor. And then on um, three days later, had the poor come with him, this huge mob of beggars and, and prostitutes and uh, and uh, broken people, and there's a hundred of them, you know, 150 of them, big crowd behind him. And the emperor said, what's all this? And Valerian said, or, or uh, uh, Lawrence said, this is the treasures of the church, and which made the emperor really mad, and he killed him. But, 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 the, but, the, but, but it led uh, to a big revival when other people saw that the church was actually making a difference in the lives of, of others. It, it drew them to the church. You know, when, when Lawrence does this thing, when he says the treasures of the church are the ones that we're helping, it's the ones that we're trying to bless, it kind of reframed what the most important thing for a church is. Our treasures at Mount Pleasant are not the things that we own, a van across the street or, the, or this building. It's not even the people who attend here. It's the people that we're helping. And it kind of goes to a question, you know, if the Mount Pleasant Church closed tomorrow, who would care? Would anybody notice? Would it bother people outside of the ones who attend here? Are we making any sort of a difference in the community? And, and, we, and we've, we've been inching forward in that. We want to become a church that, that, that sees our role here to be a light in this community. And part of being a light in this community is to lift up the people who are knocked down, to lift up the broken, to, to raise up the people who don't have a chance to be an advocate for the ones who have no advocate. And, and when we do that, then we're focused on the things that God treasures the most, which are people. Uh, that's who he loves. When it says that God so loved the world, he gave his son, it's the people of this world that God uh, is so crazy about. And when a church is properly calibrated, it looks at this world the same way that Jesus does. And it sees the people who need the Lord really clearly and wants to make some sort of a difference in that. Now that ultimately... That's what this passage is about. But the language that James is going to use to make his point is as rough as any language that he uses anywhere in the book. And and if you read it with any sort of an open heart, it's hard not to feel smacked now and again by the things that James is saying. 
So I just want to mention that again to you before we get into this thing. And uh, all right, all that said, let's charge ahead here boldly. He says, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery coming upon you. So he starts off gentle, right? He starts off with a light touch. Some people think that he's talking to people outside the church. And I don't think so, because earlier in chapter 2, he says uh, to the rich, he says, when a poor man comes in and you ignore him, you're being judges. He gets on people who have something already in James. But he's doing it again here, but he's doing it a little harder. And he's saying, you know, you like to think that your money is a morally neutral thing, that it doesn't really matter either way. And James says, you need to feel different about that. He says, weep and wail because of the misery that's coming on you. In other words, there's going to be some judgment for people who do not use their resources in this life the way that they're supposed to. There's going to be some judgment for people who, who keep it all for themselves, who don't think about others, who, whose only focus is what will make me comfortable, what will make me safe, what will make me happy. When your whole life is about those sorts of things, you're not going to see and be where God wants you to be. He goes further. He says, your wealth has rotted, your uh, moths have eaten your clothes, your gold and silver are corroded. Uh, you, their corrosion will testify against you and your flesh like fire because you've hoarded wealth in the last days. Now, he's not talking, James is not, about inflation, right? But inflation's a good illustration of what he's talking about here. If you had $100 last year and you put it in a coffee can and you pull that $100 out this year, it, it's worth less than it was a year ago. That same hundred dollars is why it's something like seven or eight percent less than it was a year ago. Uh, it won't buy as much. I mean, just and you've not done anything with it. You just put it in the bank because interest rates are not as high as seven or eight percent. Even if you put it in the bank and you go back and get your hundred dollars with interest, it's worth less after you've kept it for a year than it was uh, a year ago. The stuff we have has a way of, of losing value. You like to think that it will always be there and it will always bless and it will always grow, and, 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 but it doesn't always work that way. When I buy a car, when I buy some clothes, when I buy some shoes, the minute I put them on my feet, they're wearing out. The minute I drive it out of the showroom, it's worth a little bit less. And, and that's the nature of stuff. I, I've got a friend uh, here, I teased him a few years ago. He said he was looking for a no-maintenance house. Remember that? No maintenance house. Have you, ever, have you ever bought a no maintenance house? Well, no, there is no such thing. As soon as you buy it, it's breaking. As soon as you buy it, it's not working right. As soon as you buy it, you've got trouble because that's how houses work. That's how cars work. That's how everything works. And that's what James is saying in this passage. You like to think that you could get something that would uh, make it all easy, but, but, there, but that's not how stuff works. And Jesus, by the way, concurs with that. Jesus in, in Luke 16, 19 says, What's highly valued amongst men, referring to money, is detestable in God's sight. Paul agrees with that. In 1 Corinthians 7, 31, he says that the, that the world in its present form is passing away. It's just not going to be the stuff we hold on to. It, it's losing value every minute. John, in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, says the world and all the stuff about the world, it's fading. It's just not going to be... Uh, worth as much as you think it is at the end of all that. And that's what James is saying. And when he says it, he's just agreeing with everybody else who writes in the New Testament. Nothing in and of itself wrong with money, but we like to pretend that money will keep us secure. We like to pretend that we need money to be happy. And James is saying it just doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. The stuff we have can't be counted upon. In Daniel chapter 5, there's a story about a king named Belshazzar, and he was having a great feast, and God uh, sends a, a hand to write on the wall some words that tells Belshazzar, your, your time's up. You're in this party, and you're getting drunk, and, and, and your time is up. Now, when he was in the party, Belshazzar, outside the walls of Babylon, King Cyrus and the Persian army was there. And Belshazzar and Babylon knew that Persia was outside, they didn't think there was any way in the world they could come inside because Babylon had these giant walls. They, uh, walls were uh, uh, wide enough for three chariots to race across the top of them. And, uh, and they didn't think there was any way in the world an army could come across those great big walls. They had a, an ongoing supply of water because the Euphrates River, one of the four or five biggest rivers in the world, flowed through the middle of the city, went under one of the walls and flowed through the city. And so Cyrus just rerouted it. He had his soldiers dig a trench big enough to move one of the biggest rivers in the world a different direction. 
and he marched through the, the, marched through the riverbed into the city and, and killed everyone who was a leader. And while all this is getting ready to happen, the, the Babylon leaders are getting drunk. It really is like a Titanic story. You know, the Titanic was the ship that couldn't sink, but it did. We like to pretend that certain things can't ever fail. Certain things that we create and build will always be here, but that's not the nature of things. It's not the nature of stuff. And to forget that, I'm not only blind, it's, it's foolish. He says, look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the Lord Almighty. What he's saying here is in, in your pursuit of money, you've taken advantage of, of little people. In your pursuit of money, you've used your influence and your power to hurt people who didn't have the, uh, didn't have the ability to fight back. Now, you may think to yourself, I've never once hired a harvester, so I'm, I'm probably fine on this verse. But it's more the principle. It's more the principle that he's after. I've told you before, you know, it's weird what stories affect your life and that you never forget. One story that has, has affected my life that I'll never forget is being behind somebody who I knew was a Christian, who I knew was a leader in the church, as he just crushed somebody at Wendy's about getting a hamburger with pickles on it. I ordered this without pickles. I want to see your manager. And the 16-year-old behind, you can just tell this vacant stare as you're about, you know, she's not even listening any longer. And he's just barking and yelling and screaming. And, and it just didn't matter at all to that kid, their minimum wage. You know, I, I, I want a new hamburger and I want my money back. And, and, and so I think at the end of it, they got a new burger and they got their money back, but they lost any chance at all to have any influence on this kid the rest of their life. And, and it just seems like it's a terrible trade. You know, you, 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 all the time, you, you, how do you treat the people who, who are just doing their jobs? A policeman pulls you over and he says, did you know you were speeding? And you do know you were speeding, but you think you were just flowing the, following the flow of traffic. How do you treat that guy? How do you treat the guy who's just doing their job? How do you treat the people who are trying to drive trucks around on the highway and they're in your way? How do you treat the people who are serving you food and, and, and cleaning your room? How, how do you treat people? I mean, sometimes we can be really hard if we think we can get away with it. Um, and even Christians. We do a thing across the road. You may have seen some of the stuff still there uh, from it. Uh, the youth do it called Mud Bowl. And the mud bowl is a, just what it sounds like. It's a, we make this huge uh, muddy pit and put obstacles in it, and there's relays and tugs of war and different things like that, and they can go out there and, and horse around. And a lot of years we have 70, 80 kids come to it. And, and, um, and so Gabe thought as a, as a generous thing, he would give the kids a snow cone. So he arranged to have a snow cone guy there and said, let Gary buy a snow cone, and won't that be nice? And now he kind of gave him a limit, don't spend, you know, too much here, and we gave him a couple hundred dollars or whatever, and let's just do that. Great, we'll be there, and they were doing it. Well, we had 150 kids come to the Mud Bowl, and you never want to punish a ministry leader who's more successful than they should be, so I mean, it was, we were going to adjust our budget a little, right? We didn't, we didn't know we were going to have to, but we just didn't think we'd do, have nearly this number of of kids. And while I went over at the end, I'm not really a participant in the uh, Mud Bowl experience. I, I'm more of a, a sarcastic, casual observer on the outside edges. But I, I walked over to the Mud Bowl deal, and, and you got kids wanting to give you a hug. You know, oh, come give me a hug. I don't want your hug, you know. And I, truthfully, don't want a hug when we're not muddy, but I really don't want one now, and, you know, stay away. And, and, uh, and so I'm talking to Gabe there after the deal, and, and uh, the kid behind the counter at the snow cone place says, hey, there's no limit, right? And he's, well, yeah, I actually had a, kind of had a limit in my mind. I talked to the other guy, and, oh, I didn't know well, how much we spent. We spent about $1,000 in, uh, in ice. Now, you've got a choice at that moment, right? I was real proud of Gabe on this thing. I want to I wanna comment him on this. I, I compliment him on this because I thought he handled this the right way. I do. I mean, we ate it. We ate it. Now, now, now in a different world, he certainly could have said, well, I'm not paying it. I'm not paying it. I told the one guy this, and that's your fault, not mine. You need to eat that cost. And if he had said that, which again, has every right in the world to say that, what would they have said at the snow cone uh, factory when they all got back there? Boy, those guys in Mount Pleasant, they're sure smart about their dollars. Was that what they said? Boy, you can't take advantage of them. Not those guys. They know what's going on. 
No, they wouldn't have said that. They'd have been mad about it. And they would have told anybody who would have listened how mad they were about it, how we had taken advantage of them. I really do believe when it comes to your finances, if you honor God, he will honor you. As a rule of life, I believe that. If you honor God, he will honor you. Right? Well, you say, well, that's crazy. I mean, I mean, I mean $800 difference or, or $700, $800? I mean, I mean, how much is your reputation worth? It's not worth that, is it? Man, it's worth so much more than that. It's just worth so much more than that. And I can imagine some defensiveness as I'm talking about this. Well, that's, that's great for your church and snow cones. But, I mean, in business, business is business. And we got to watch every dollar. And, I, you know, again, it's your money. It's your money. I'm not telling you what to do with it. It is your money. It's yours, and I can't tell you. We're not a cult. We're we're not a cult. It's not communism. I'm not telling you what you have to do with your money. Do whatever you want to with it. But James is saying here in this passage that when you kind of cheat somebody out of it because you have the power and they don't, God notices that sort of thing. God pays attention to that sort of thing. It ticks God off a little bit when we line our own pockets at the expense of other people. And we need to be real careful about how often and how casually we might be tempted to do that. He says, you've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Again, he's, it's a picture of a war. And you might think, again, this seems like a little bit of extreme language, but it is a war in James's mind. I mean, it really matters. It's life and death. And when you see other people who are just barely scraping by, and yet you're able to hoard and keep it all for yourself, it's sin. I mean, in, in, in as clear a language as I can present it to you, it's just, it's sin. For you to hold on to it so tight when you can see that people are just falling all over themselves and having trouble. You have condemned and murder, murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. We don't know for sure what James is saying here. There's some debate about that. And if you read 10 or 15 different Bible translations, you will get some different interpretations on this verse. And the way you know you're getting a different interpretation, some translations, not the NIV, which is what I'm using, will capitalize innocent one. They think he's actually talking about Jesus here, the innocent one, meaning meaning Christ. So he could be saying, you've taken advantage of guys who were innocent. Just, just got, I mean, just generic innocent one. You, 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 you've, you've fattened yourself, you've taken all this money, and you've hurt somebody who, who needed help. By you being indifferent, you've hurt somebody who needed help. Or he could be talking about Jesus here, and I kind of think he is talking about Jesus here. I think the innocent one is referring to Christ, and it's kind of a picture, Matthew 25. Jesus says, at the end of time, I'm going to sit on a throne, and I'm going to divide everyone into two camps. And to the ones on my right, my, uh, like sheep and goats, the ones on my right, my sheep here, he says, I'm going to tell them, I was hungry, and you fed me, I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink, I was naked, and you clothed me, I was sick and in prison, and you came to visit, and the guys on the, on the, 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 the right are going to be hornswoggled, uh, bewildered by that, all that, they're going to, Lord, we never saw you, we never saw you, and he'll say, but when you saw the least of these and took care of them, you were taking care of me, and then I'll turn to the left, and I'll say, I'll say to them, but when you guys saw me hungry and thirsty and naked and lonely, you did nothing. You did nothing. You went your own way. You ignored me. And, and, and they're all going to say, well, wait a minute. If we'd have been you, Jesus, we'd have done it. We know what you look like, white robe, blue sash. We'd have stopped right then and taken care of whatever it was you needed. And Jesus will say, no, whenever you saw the least of these and did nothing, that was me. It's like you were ignoring me. And at some, at some level, our judgment going into heaven is based on how we react to the least of these. At some level, our judgment going into the next to, to heaven is, is based on how we responded with our stuff. And again, it's your stuff. Do whatever you want to with it. And I really do mean that. It's your stuff. I mean, it's yours. But, but it occurs to me when I'm reading this, when I'm getting into this thing and I'm thinking about it, how, how often I don't believe Jesus. Now, now I, I, and that's painful to say out loud because, I mean, I, I think I believe him on everything. I think I'm fine. But, but when you look at how I live, I mean, you could make an argument, but, but you really believe him because Jesus says that, 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 that you're going to be marked by how you respond to people who are the least. 
He says, you're going to be marked by how you take care of the poor. When I, when I invite someone to my house who cannot pay me back, who cannot give me anything to make it even, who, who is just completely at my generosity, right? They're not important. They're not, they're not prominent in the community. My reputation won't benefit from being associated with them. There's, there's no gain to me other than me just being kind to them. When you take care of somebody like that, the least of these, you're only doing it because you love the Lord. You're only doing it because you respect Jesus. You're only doing it because you care what he thinks about you. You're not doing it for any other reason. There's, there is such value in that, Jesus says. And when Jesus tells us to, to put our attention that way and to put our focus that way and to put our consideration that way, this is what he has in mind. This is the kind of thing that he's hoping that we will, uh, that we will see. It reveals our heart. I find about myself that the more money that I have, if I'm not careful... I can be more stingy, which doesn't make sense at all. I'm, I'm familiar with another church. Uh, I read about it that uh, there was a prominent leader in the church. Everybody knew who, that, who the guy was, and he had been very successful in business. Had just made a, a, just a bunch of money, and, and everybody knew that he had. Had a great big house and, and, uh, and had done very well. Had little businesses all over the place. Just super, super successful. Everybody in town knew who the guy was because he was so, so, uh, so, such a big deal. And, and he got up at church once, said he wanted to share his testimony. And he said, you know, I didn't always start like this. This wasn't always my life. He says, I remember when I was just getting started. I was uh, 20 years old. And, and I was sitting on the front row of the, of the sermon, and, and the preacher was talking, and, and he said, you know, would you give it all to God today? And all I had was $20 in my billfold. And I said, yes, Lord, I'll do it. And I took 20 all I had, and I gave it to God that day. And he's blessed me ever since. And everybody kind of applauded, and he sat down by an old lady in the front row, and she leaned over and said, I dare you to do it again. It's harder, isn't it? It's harder. It's harder when you've got $100 to give it than 20. It's harder when you've got 1,000 to give it than 100. It's harder when you've taken all this time to build whatever it is you've got to build and you have to give part of it. It's harder. I don't know why it is, but it is. If I've got an old junkie car, I loan it freely. If I've got a, a nice new car, I don't want you to lean on it, let alone drive it off. I don't want you to get too close to it if it's really nice and new. If I've got something that's brand new and precious to me, I don't share it as easy as I would something that I've had for a long, long time. Um, I, I know one family that, that had this really, really, really nice set of china. It was, it was hand-painted, handcrafted in a different country. It had been passed down from grandmother to daughter to mother to daughter and, and family for three or four generations. It never came out of the cabinet. This is for special occasions, and apparently there's never been a special occasion good enough to bring these dishes out, right? And I bet there's at least one or two of you who know what I'm talking about. And it's not just dish, it's anything. It's anything. The more precious it is, the more I, I have a hard time sharing it with anybody. It's, you know, the, the Tolkien thing. If it gets real precious, it's all I can think about, right? It's mine. It's all mine. And it's a weird deal if you think about it. I mean, you would think that as a math, like a story problem. I've never good at story problems in math. You would think as a math story problem, I'd be more generous the more I had. It'd be even easier to give big chunks away. You would think that once I built up a certain reputation in my career or whatever it was, it'd be easier to take chances, you know? But it's not. And that's curious to me. I read this verse. Somebody sent me this verse uh, this week in Facebook. Uh, they were talking about something else. But they were, <clears throat> they were saying that, you know, God promises he's going to take care of us. God promises he's going to be there for us. And they sent me this verse. They said, when you read this verse, does it inspire you? I'll give it all to you if you just bow down and worship me. Well, it shouldn't. If you're not familiar with this verse, uh, the he said there is the devil. And he says it to Jesus when they're on top of the mountain. I'll give it all to you if you just bow down and worship me. God never really makes this promise. This is always more of a devilish promise. 
that if you just follow God hard enough, you'll have everything you want. That's not really a God promise. And again, I have to ask myself, do I really believe Jesus? Do I believe him when he says the things that he says? Do I trust him? And it's hard. And again, I'm not telling you what you have to do or not do. I'm not. I'm not telling you what you should do. I'm just telling you that James in this whole passage is very concerned that we do the best we can with our one and only life. That we, we take advantage of the time we're given and the resources we have to do as much in this world as we can. And, and you need to decide what that is. There's a risk that someone could come in here today and say, man, the church must really be in a bad spot for him to get and preach this sermon. And we're not, A. But even if we were, you don't have to give it here. You don't. You can give it to, uh, uh, to Hope Resource or, or Bertha's or Becky's or Life or all sorts of different ministries in town that are great ministries. Um, you could give it to a different church. Now, that's going to make them laugh if you, I go to Mount Pleasant, but I don't trust them with this. So here, they're going to laugh. They're, they're going to laugh at Hillcrest or First Church of God or wherever else. That's all right. Everybody needs a smile. So go, you can do that. You can do that. If you feel like, you know, I just don't think you're going to do the right thing with it, that's okay. I know one a, a guy who felt like he couldn't give a, a friend of mine, he couldn't give uh, money to the guys at the intersections with cardboard signs. He just felt bad about it. So I just can't do it. I, I feel like there, it's, it's, there are so many ways they can make a living besides that, and they're not, they're not doing it. And, and they're able-bodied because they're standing out there in the sun all day long collecting money. So I know, I know they could, and I just can't do it. I can't give them money. So what he started doing was he kept, he kept food in his car, like prepackaged stuff and water. And if he'd see them, he'd offer it. And they weren't always appreciative. Let me, let me mention that ahead of time. It wasn't like it was always, oh, thank you so much. It wasn't like that. Sometimes they weren't appreciative. But more often than you know, they were. More often than you know, they were. I've known people who, depending on what part of the world they lived in, if, if they were around homeless people or saw some guys like that, they kept blankets and stuff in their car that they could hand out. I, I've known different people who, who just on purpose keep extra groceries at the house because they know they might have to take a meal to somebody and they just plan it's part of their budget they 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 want to make sure they do that sort of thing all the time there's a thousand different ways to be generous there's a thousand different ways to share there's lots of things a person can do to take what god has given you and try to bless as many people as you can with it because we don't get to take any of it with us right you go to a funeral and the, somebody says, well, how much was he worth when he died? And, and, and they'll answer that with a money figure. And that money figure, I promise, if the Christian world view is the correct one, the money is the least of that fellow's concerns. The money that he has is the least of his. That's not how he's calculating his worth, not in that moment. You might go to a funeral and somebody in the back say, well, how much did they leave behind? They left everything. They left it all behind, right? You only get one chance. James is saying, do the best you can with your one chance. And so I wanted to make sure I told you that from James and challenge you with it too. Let me pray with you. I have the band come back up here. Dear Lord God, I thank you for this group. I pray for them. God, I ask you to move in their hearts. I ask you to move in their, in their lives. Father, there's a... There's a thousand different ways we can follow after you. I just pray you help us to take one of those avenues, whatever it is, and run hard after you, God, put you first. I thank you, God, that you're gracious to us. I thank you, God, that you, though you were rich, became poor for our behalf, and that, Father, we're called to follow you. Help us to see what we're supposed to do. And, and give us the courage to follow you, God, whatever it is you push out there. And... Uh, and I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, at the end of our service here, we offer a time to pray. I want to toss out two or three things. The, 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 the nature of a sermon like this is you could feel like, man, if I go forward to pray here, everybody's going to expect me to write some sort of a big check. And that really isn't the, it's not the case. So I want to say that first of all. Not the case. It really is your money. Do what you want to with it. And there's no judgment for me. And any one of you could take a hard look at my books and wonder, hey, what's going on here then, Mr. Big Shot? I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to, it's hard to follow Jesus, just so we're clear on that point. It's hard to follow Jesus. 
But we offer this time at the end not to pray about the sermon I just preached. That's never the point of this time at the end. Go pray about the sermon Jeff just preached. The point of this time at the end is, where do you stand with the Lord? You know? And, and where you stand with the Lord may have nothing to do with what I just said. I, you may be doing wonderfully well in that thing, but you don't want to leave here if you and God aren't on the right, right page. You know? If you and God aren't 100% where you're supposed to be. So we offer you this time at the end of the service to take advantage, to either pray where you're at, and again, I think there's great value if you came here with somebody to grab a hold of their hand or put your arm on their shoulder and pray together, and I really do recommend that. I think there's some value to that. Or to come up here to the front and to pray with the people on the side. They're not expert prayers. There's no special degree in praying that they have, but they'll commit to pray with you, you know, and, and there is some value. Jesus says where two or three are gathered, that there's power there, that I'm right there with you. And so, so to come here and just pray with one or two people and ask God to move. And honestly, it may not even be about anything going on here at all. I don't need to pray for my grandma. She's really having a hard time. Or pray for my neighbor. I know they're really struggling. Or, or pray for something else. Pray for my kid. I know they're, they're really in a, in a hole. And sometimes we wonder why we don't get the important things that we really care about, those kinds of things. And it's because we're not asking. We're not taking it to God. We're not, we're not asking for his favor, and, and, and he longs to hear us. And these are the kinds of prayers, I think, that God wants to answer. So take advantage of this time to come pray and to ask God to move, if, if you will. Why don't you stand up? We're going to do two songs. Uh, if anybody needs to, uh, to do anything with God, any business to do with the Lord, that you can take advantage of this time.